How is everyone? Excellent, excellent. I'm also well. So here's my source code, run it in the cloud for me, I, I do not care how. Um, this talk is about how platforms work. Uh, we've had a lot of talks about orchestration of infrastructure resources. We've had some talks about uh, scheduling workloads across those, uh, those resources. And this talk is going to sort of move up the software stack into uh, what, we, what it looks like if you have an operationally mature production environment. So I want to discuss uh, platforms, but I need to make sure we're on the same page. So I'm going to be defining what I think a platform is uh, so that we're, we all agree, and then hopefully you agree with me, and when you talk about platforms after this conference, uh, you'll say what I say, because I think it's a good idea. All right, but first and foremost, the most important thing, who has Twitter? It's 2016, folks. Twitter, Twitter. If you have Twitter, you can tweet at me. If you disagree with what I say, please feel free to live tweet that. We'll see how it goes. Um, but you can reach, it, reach me this way. Who's heard of email? E-mail, email, yeah. If you disagree with me a lot more, you can email me. This is my personal address. Feel free to, to reach out to me. That's fine. Uh, I write some things on the internet from time to time. Uh, you can read them there. That should be something you can check out later. So uh, I work for this company called Pivotal. Uh, who's heard of Pivotal? Just a few folks. Actually, a lot of folks. That's great. Um, we build a lot of open source software. Um, we also sell some things, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, we believe in giving back. We believe in giving more than we get. I think that's great, and I really appreciate that Pivotal lets me come to places like this and give talks like this. So that's their due. So let's talk about minimum viable platform. We like MVP. We heard MVP in the last talk. Uh, that's a great thing to talk about. Uh, we don't always spend enough time figuring out what viable means. Right? We spend a lot of time with minimum. Um, and I like this that it's MVP, minimum viable platform. So let's describe the operational characteristics of a, of a mature environment uh, using a set of rubrics. So I'm going to describe a few capabilities that you should have in production today if you have an operationally mature environment. First, you need fully dynamic DNS routing and load balancing. If you want to push a new application or a new service into your architecture, you shouldn't have to talk to anyone in order to get resources provisioned. You shouldn't have to talk to anyone to get DNS entries, poke a hole in a firewall, adjust the load balancer, um, update uh, configuration management inventory files. If you have to do any of that, it's not very automated, is it? And if, you have to, if you have to manually adjust automation, how automated is your system? You shouldn't have to talk to anyone to do that. You shouldn't have to file a ticket and wait for IT or wait for anyone else. It should just happen. And it's not just important for pushing new things, but also scaling out existing applications or even scaling them in in order to get more efficient resource utilization. You should be able to do that, again, without the intervention of another human being. In fact, it should be fully automated, and that'll be a theme. The automation should be there already. So we need a backing services broker. If you build an application and it isn't just a toy, then it probably talks to other things, right? This is a data store or a database, a caching layer, a message bus, perhaps an existing API that you've written that, that exists somewhere else, or even a mainframe that you're trying to interact with, a, an Oracle database over here that's absolutely massive that you have to interact with. Whatever it is, you have to connect an application to other things, and you should be able to do that in a fully automated way. Uh, when you deploy an application, you shouldn't have to go ask for authorization credentials and network access information in order to connect to Redis. Right? You have to send a ticket. Somebody generates, hopefully, a new password for your particular use case and application. And then they probably encrypt it. They put it in another ticket. They send it in an email. Your developers copy and paste that into their code or maybe into a configuration file. Um, that's, again, not very automated. That's putting a lot of human beings in what should otherwise be a fully automated process. So we need to be able to auto-provision backing services, new ones that we need for our services. So if we're building a new microservice and we need Redis or we need MySQL, we should be able to provision them. One click. No humans involved in that process. If you want access to existing infrastructure or existing 
services, you should be able to uh, provision the authentication and, and uh, network access information automatically, and that should be provided by the environment your applications live in. You need infrastructure orchestration. So we talked a lot about this today. You know, this is your IaaS layer, your programmable infrastructure, the ability to on-demand uh, provision, compute, storage, and networking resources. But I want to take this a step further. It isn't just about the ability to automate infrastructure, it's about having that automation already in place. You should not have to go through a provisioning step or a procurement step in order to get new resources when you want to deploy an application. You shouldn't have to wait days, weeks, any amount of time in order to get those, uh, those raw infrastructure resources. The production environment should manage that for you automatically, and again, it should be fully automated. This isn't about programmable infrastructure, it's programmed infrastructure. It's done. If you have that, if it's good, then you can get really good health management, monitoring, and recovery at several layers of the stack. If your cloud provider loses a virtual machine or in an instance for you, which happens from time to time, that should not be a paging incident. That should not be a downtime. That shouldn't be a service disruption. Your production environment should notice that, that infrastructure failure. It should know what to do about it, and it should just do it automatically. It should fix, it should recover. And you should be able to know that happened but hopefully after a good night of sleep, when you get into work, whatever next day you get into work. No big deal. And then if we move up the stack, when you deploy applications and you fan them out over a distributed cluster, and you've got maybe 50 or even 500 instances, if a few instances misbehave, maybe they die, that shouldn't be an incident either. Your production environment should notice that and recover from it. You need an immutable artifact repository. Who here has heard of containers? Hopefully by now, everybody raises their hand. Um, so containers are neat because uh, they force you to isolate the build, deploy, and run phases of managing and upgrading applications. You have to build an immutable artifact, a point in time, a snapshot of your application, something that you know about, something you can inspect, something you have provenance over, or you understand the provenance of that container, you know what's in it. And once you build it, then you have to deploy it. And once you deploy it, then you can spin it up, you can run it, and you can spin up more of them, and that happens very quickly. In order to get that, you need an, a repository, some place to put that image or that immutable artifact that is very close to production. So you can get one of the major concepts of a 12-factor app or a cloud-native app, which is the ability to spin up quickly and also have graceful shutdown. We'll talk about graceful shutdown in, in a little bit. But to be able to spin up quickly means you can respond to incoming events. You can do things like auto-scaling. And you can't respond quickly if you have to build the world every time you want to add a node to your infrastructure. That's, that's too slow. If it's minutes, it's too slow. Finally, and this is, again, minimal viable product platform, you need full log aggregation. If you, again, are distributing an application or many applications across a cluster of compute resources, you don't necessarily know where they are. You shouldn't really have to care. But it's important to be able to get the logs and understand the operational characteristics of that application in the event that it's misbehaving or you want to do analytics or you want to do event monitoring. And you shouldn't have to SSH into your production environment in order to do that and go searching around all over your file systems to try and find logs. So from this day forward, if you take nothing else away from this talk, and I hope you take other things, no more SSHing into production from this day forward. No one in this room will ever do that again, right? We don't have to do that. Or, you know, whatever they do on Windows, or RD, RDS, or, no, RDS is something else, remote desktop. Um, so this is the bare minimum set of capabilities you need to have what I consider to be an operationally mature environment. It's important for them to already be in place. I guarantee you that if you look at this list, you either have these, or you're trying to glue some components together to have it, or you're trying to find someone to give it to you, maybe off the shelf. But whatever it is, you're trying to get these set of capabilities. These will lead to development enablement. So this is where I want to ask another question. How many folks here would describe yourselves as application engineers or developers? You're building something that executives in boardrooms like to call business value. How many people are doing that? A pretty decent number. Um, okay. And then maybe on this side, how many people would, would say that your job is more uh, managing applications, keeping them alive, keeping the fires from, from overtaking everything, keeping those applications up and running. How many people are in the operator side of the, the house? Far fewer people are responsible for the mess that first group made 
the, the, in this room. And then how many people here would say, you're somewhere in the middle and you sort of do the DevOps. You have both the responsibility of building the business value and managing that business value. Right, so that's a, that's a few folks here, good. So I'd just like to get an idea of where we're at in the audience, that's hel that helps me a lot. So I wanna make one specific point and I'm gonna use a little bit of, a, of an analogy here. Um, in order to have a fully functioning car, you can't just have the electrical system of that car. Now, the, electrical, the electrical system is already fairly complicated. It's a big system, it's important, you must have it, but you need a bunch of other systems as well. They are also complicated. And they're complicated within themselves and then the integration points between them are complicated. But what's the point of having a car? It's to get in and drive it somewhere, like right away. That's what you wanna do, right? So similarly, I wanna make it really clear that when we talk about platforms, we're not just talking about containers. It's not enough to have containers. There's a lot of other stuff we need. We've talked about provisioning layers, we've talked about orchestration layers today in this talk. I'm gonna talk about the interfaces that go on top of all of that, that interact not just with the other components of your architecture, but also the people who have to interact and manage your applications in the first place. So we're moving up the stack closer to the applications that you wanna build every day that, that give you your un unique business value. So I'm gonna use Open Source Cloud Foundry uh, to demonstrate these capabilities. Just to give you a very quick overview, the Cloud Foundry comes in two basic layers. The one lower subsystem layer is called Bosch. This is distributed system lifecycle management. So this is your upgrade, you know, rolling complete upgrades with no downtime, your versioned infrastructure, uh, install on demand, but with the primitive being a complete distributed system, not just a server here and a server there that you have to put together yourself. The entire distributed system is managed as a single entity. And you can do this, uh, Bosch handles uh, stateful s distributed systems just as well as anything else. And one of the stateful distributed systems that we put on it is Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is more of your application elastic runtime plus automated services. Uh, this gives you the same sorts of resilience and rolling upgrades and, and management for applications that you're building that you get at the lower level layer for Bosch. So where Bosch is more of an operator interface, IT and operations might interact with this. Maybe you have a team called Platform Engineering. We have one called Cloud Ops that we, we like that name. You can steal it, steal Cloud Ops, that's cool. Um, and then this is more of your developer interface. So, this is for your application engineers and your application operators. And we're gonna be, mostly be using this today to do a little bit of a demonstration. Um, this is a very high level sort of bucket list of things that you get when you use Cloud Foundry out of the box. Um, a lot of this is in the minimum viable platform uh, that we talked about. I'm not gonna talk about too many of these things, but I will highlight these little cloudy bits here. Um, that's important because one of the things about Cloud Foundry is that it's completely infrastructure agnostic. You can run it on-premise in a data center, on top of like VMware stuff if you're into that, or OpenStack. And then you can also run it on AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, whatever you want. And you run an instance yourself, you manage it. So I'm actually going to be demoing running a very lightweight instance on my laptop here. Uh, so I've, I've crammed like a whole cloud right in here. Um, but, but that's neat that you can run it anywhere. So let's do a live demo. I use a gargoyle on this slide because nothing could possibly go wrong in a live demo. See where we're at, we have about 20 minutes, that's good. So what I wanna do is demonstrate the minimum viable platform capabilities using Cloud Foundry, and so I wanna show you a, a little bit of code here. I've got this little app, it's a, it's a micro service. It's micro because it's small in this case. <laughs> and uh, what we wanna do is do a little bit of a code review. How many people here do, uh, do Ruby or know about Ruby? Heard of Ruby? A few. Um, out of curiosity, how many folks here are, are doing .NET or, or interacting with .NET? Heard a lot of questions about .NET. Um, Cloud Foundry fully supports .NET on Windows, uh, and you get, with 2012, you get process uh, resource constraints, and with Windows 2016, you'll get that full containerization that was talked about yesterday, it's pretty cool. But uh, let's take a look at this Ruby app. It's very simple and easy to read, so let's first look at our gem file in the Ruby ecosystem. This is how we, we mention uh, third-party libraries that, we, that we're going to rely on, so I'm going to use the, excuse me, the Puma web server and the Sinatra web framework. Can we read this in the back? Yes, good. And the Sinatra web framework is very lightweight, particularly good for uh, building uh, JSON APIs very quickly, good for demos, that sort of thing. People even use it in production and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Let's take a look at the set. Again, very simple. Um, 
We're going to bind to the IP address that says, well, listen on any interface. When you're running in a containerized system, you have an isolated network interface. You don't necessarily know a lot about that network interface. And when you're running on a distributed cluster, um, you also have to get information from your environment about uh, what port we expect your application to run on. So we don't hard code. You don't have the guarantees of port 80 or port 443 anymore. So because of that, we will also get our port number off of the environment. This is one of these 12 factor principles to get our configuration information off of the environment. Maybe for development, if I'm not running this in a distributed cluster, I'll just go ahead and default to a number and that's fine. And this endpoint, as I said, is very simple. It's going to emit JSON. The key will be instance and the value will be the CF instance index. Another environment variable that Cloud Foundry provides us because as we fan out or horizontally scale an application, Cloud Foundry will keep track of how many instances we have and how many we want. And it'll guarantee it and make certain promises about uh, always having that number of instances. So it will keep track. And it's important to do that because we don't have a pre-forked server anymore running on a, sim on a single node. We have, uh, we have scale out via the process model, another 12 factor app, but happen happening on a large distributed cluster or in this case, a somewhat small distributed cluster. But nevertheless, uh, this will help us demonstrate ideas around horizontal scalability and load balancing and that sort of thing. So I have this application, and what I want to do is deploy it into the cloud. I'm going to use the CF command line utility. We'll be operating somewhere in that region of the screen. Uh, the CF command line utility is a Go wrapper around a RESTful API. Everything that I'm doing here, you can do fully programmable via a REST API, and that's pretty great. Uh, but this Go utility can also be run anywhere. And I'm targeting a specific instance of Cloud Foundry via this API. It's running on my laptop, as I mentioned. I am an admin user. I will, uh, I will also be targeting this org in this space. All of the applications and the services that I deploy will be isolated into a space, which is a, just a general bucket inside of an org, which is another general bucket. And you can have as many of those as you want. That's kind of nice for multi-tenancy, um, that you have that level of isolation. But what I want to do, and just to give you an idea, I am in this application here. So I just want to type CF push and deploy this app. Before I do that, I want to show you one more piece of code. It's this manifest.yaml file. That's trippy, right? Manifest.yaml. Uh, manifest.yaml file is something that Cloud Foundry expects. And it's a basic file that lists the operational expectations we have of this application when it runs on the platform. You can put various resource constraints in here and other operational characteristics. I just have a few things. I'm going to give my app a name. I'm going to give it a memory limit. If this application had a memory leak and hits that limit, the platform will shut down that instance of this application because it hit its memory limit. And it'll spin up a new one in its place. It will err on the side of availability. And then I'll just give it a basic command to run this application. So when I want to deploy it, I'm just going to type CF push. I'm going to use a little bit of the internet now, so if you could stop streaming from Netflix, that would be fantastic. Okay, so here's what's happening. When we, hit, when we type CF push, this takes my application and puts it into a stager. So the stager's responsibility in Cloud Foundry is to build that immutable artifact that we talk about. It needs to build that container, that image. So what it does is it takes the app, deploys it into the stager, it, starts with a very sparse uh, Ubuntu-based file system, Linux file system, and then it, it will inspect the application. It knows it's a Ruby app, so then it will put down the Ruby runtime. It'll put down the resources that we need on top of that base file system. It'll do the same thing for Java, PHP, uh, Go binaries, um, Python, .NET, whatever you've got. It'll put the, uh, the runtime on there, and then because it's Ruby, it knows that we need to run bundle install in order to install our third-party libraries. It'll cram our app into that container. And now we have a container. That's really nice. So it builds that container. And then it stores it in what we call the blob store, which is an immutable artifact repository. That's like a, it's analogous to a Docker repo. But all of that build pipeline is already baked into this, uh, this production environment that I have here. And then, of course, it'll just spin up an instance. By default, it'll spin up one. So let's see what happens if we go to this in our web browser. We can see that we have an instance. That's good. That's helpful. That's very good for my demo. But maybe we want to scale it up. So I just want to scale it. So there we go. Now we have three. And if I want to look at this application in a little more detail, I can do that using CF app. And I can see that I have three instances running. What I'll do down here is I'll actually go ahead and tail the logs. I want full log aggregation. right? So I have three instances, and I want log aggregation. And you won't be able to see the logs in quite detail, but if I start reloading, you'll see that 
we have we got DNS automatically. We are obviously routing requests, and we have full uh, load balancing support. We're load balancing across these instances, and we can also see the logs being aggregated. So something that I will do here uh, in this little box right here, I'm just going to run a little while loop where I curl this endpoint, and so we should be able to see the instances that we hit, and we'll just keep this running for a little while. Now, this application is very basic. Uh, I mentioned that anything that you build that doesn't connect to something else is a toy, so we want to save some state or interact with some state, but of course, we're building stateless applications, another big 12-factor app, and what that means is that the state is going to be managed externally from the applications that provide the business logic. So let's take this up a notch. Who here would say that you build enterprise-grade software? Like, we're here to build real stuff, right? You've certainly been in a meeting where somebody said this must be enterprise grade. Well, let's go ahead and take this up a notch. So I'm going to check out this branch, Enterprise Features, and of course I'm going to check out a branch because I'm, pro I'm a professional and I check my code in. All right, now we have some Enterprise Features. Let's take a look at it. Let's first look at the gem file. So I'm going to use a little wrapper uh, around getting environment information from Cloud Foundry called CF App Utils. This is just a, something in the Ruby ecosystem. Makes it a little, little bit easier to interact with environment variable information. Um, and then I'm also going to use Redis. So Redis is going to store my state. Now I know that everyone here knows that Redis is like the first stop in a fully enterprise grade data store that you can rely on without anything else, right? You're all just going to let me say that? Okay, Redis is a great cache, great caching layer, right? Very good at caching. Uh, up until very recently, the primary uh, contributor to Redis worked for Pivotal. Um, he chose to move on, but uh, we're really happy about, about Redis. We like it. So I'm going to use Redis. It's very good for demoing in this particular case, and it's very good as a cache, but do not actually use it as a primary data store. So let's take a look at this app. What are we going to do to make this enterprise great? Well, we're going to build analytics. So this is free career advice from me to you. If someone comes to you and says, we need this application to be enterprise grade and you're not quite sure what they mean, just say, sure thing. I'll add analytics. They don't know what it means, but they read about it in a magazine and they know they want it. So let's look at what we're going to do here. We need to get a Redis connection. So if we want to store state in this backing data store, we need a Redis connection. So what I'm going to do, let's put this in the center here, is I'm going to uh, inspect the environment using this object-oriented wrapper. We won't do that. We will do this. And if we have information about Redis, then we'll go ahead and fetch the host port and password for that Redis connection. Now, you'll notice I'm not hard-coding it here. All right? And it's not in a config file anywhere. There's nothing on my sleeve. It's just, it's just here. Um, but what I want is I want the environment to tell me, when I say I want a Redis, I want the production environment that's running to tell me, here's your Redis. And then I just want to connect to it. Now, the analytics we're going to do is we're going to increment visits every time we hit this API endpoint, and we'll go ahead and emit visits as well when we, when we hit it. So we'll be able to see visits increment across a horizontally scaled set of front ends, right? So that's just a, it's relatively basic still, but it does demonstrate this capability, uh, which is pretty good. So to deploy this application again, let's call this version two maybe. I'm going to type CF push. So what this is going to do is build a new image, a completely new one. We have immutable artifacts. They're completely distinct from one another. So it will build, build a new image, and then it will shut down, destroy the old instances of my application, and replace them with new ones. Because we don't patch or update in this cloud world anymore, right? We don't, we don't update in place and restart a, a, you know, a web server on a, on a virtual machine somewhere. We don't even care about that. We just destroy and create. That's all we do. And we can see that what we're getting here is an internal server error, which is uh, a little bit alarming. Uh, can anyone, does anyone have an idea of why we might be getting an internal server error right now? While I look through this stack trace over here. No Redis. Whoever said that gets a free beer when someone else is offering them. I will give it to you myself. So we don't have a, we don't have a Redis, and we expect one. So we currently have an application that's failing. So what I'm going to do is check out my working code, which happens to be a master. I'm going to go ahead and push that into production right now so that you know, we fall back, we roll back to a working version. But what I want to also do is create an instance of Redis. So down here. Um, what I'm going to do is type CF services, and you can see that we don't have any services running right now. So within this org in this space, there are no services. We want to create some. 
So I'm going to go to my CF marketplace. The marketplace is a list of things we can provision access to or provision new instances of. So you can see here that I can provision a couple variants of MySQL. I can provision RabbitMQ and also Redis. The Redis, again, is very important to me right now. Um, I'm also, again, running this on my laptop. So you can see that these are relatively small. And you might say, Casey, these are single points of failure in your application architecture. And that would be correct for my particular development machine. But in the more uh, uh, production grade versions of these, uh, you can turn on plans. Uh, you can see under plans, you can turn on plans for each of these that are HA and quite large. So you can get high availability out of these backend services. But again, I'm running it on my laptop here. So I want an instance of Redis. By the way, we can see that our application is back up and running. That's good. Maybe nobody noticed my mistake. So I'm going to create a service. It's called Redis. I'm going to run it on a sh the shared VM plan, which means specifically that we're just going to spin up a virtual machine somewhere, and its job is to run Redis instances. And it will do capacity planning on that virtual machine, and anytime we need more, it'll automatically spin up more. Um, and all of these Redis's are isolated from one another, which is also good. Um, and then uh, what I want to do is also give it a name. It's going to back this application, so we'll just namespace it, because why not? Now I have an instance of Redis. If it takes you more than a couple of minutes to get a new piece of uh, infrastructure or architecture for your application that you're building in production, then it's too long. A couple of minutes maximum. So it just took me a couple of seconds to create a Redis. And if I type CF services, you can see that we now have a Redis. But one thing that you will notice is that under bound apps, there are no applications bound to this instance. So this is a very lonely Redis instance. It's all by itself. And that's important, because sometimes you want to auto-provision things from scratch, and sometimes you want to connect to something else that already exists. But the actual connection between applications and services should be brokered, as we talked about with a service broker. And the way we're going to do that is by binding an application to this service. So I'm going to bind the service. This is the application. And this is the service. And now if I type CF services, you can see that this application is able to communicate with this service. Now what does this do? If we get configuration management information off of the environment, if we get uh, credentials for connecting to other instances off of the environment, it's a lightweight way to do service discovery. There are some more uh, automated ways. But this is, a, this is a good model that leads to good architectural design principles. Uh, if we do that, though, in order, to do, um, uh, in order to update the environment information or update credentials and access information, you do need to restart instances of an application, right? So the application is currently running a couple of instances. We can see that up here with CF app. And what we want to do is uh, we can just restart them if we want to. But I also want to try to uh, deploy this code base again. Now, uh, you might not have seen it before, but whenever I was deploying our new enterprise-grade version, uh, I mentioned that we destroy instances and then we create new instances. And if you do that, uh, in the most basic example, you'll have downtime. Right? So when we actually deploy applications, we want to deploy with no downtime, right? So sometimes we call this blue-green deployment. Sometimes we call it zero downtime deploys. And what I want to do is I want to deploy this new version with zero downtime. So what I'm going to do is a CF zero downtime push. Uh, this is a plugin uh, for Cloud Foundry that's called Autopilot. And what it does is it automates blue-green deployment. And that's pretty nice. So I need to give it a path to an app for this particular command. The app exists in this location. I also need, it, need to give it a path to a manifest file, which happens to be here. Oh, and I also need to give it the name of the application. Where were my pair programmers at? Anyway. So the application that I want to do blue-green deployment on is named CWEST CFENV. The manifest is in that file, and then, of course, the path is in this local directory. So we'll go ahead and get that started. <coughs> what this is going to do is build a new immutable artifact, a new container. It's going to spin it up. It's going to give it a random host name or a random route. Um, and then you can also choose to do things. You can inject things like can canary deployment or uh, testing into this mix. If the application looks good, you can take the high-level route that, uh, that was given to our initial version, and you can map that, start mapping that traffic over to the new version of our application. And you can do that in what's called a rolling or zero downtime deploy. Uh, we, got a new we got a server error. Let's take a look at our logs.
I will admit I wasn't expecting that one. Can't connect to Redis, okay. Let's try a node, a, a downtime deploy. So another thing that I'll show you here while this is deploying is if you have the right credentials, you, you happen to be able to type CF ENV. In order to get the environment variable information provided to your application instance, or your application. So this will unencrypt them and provide them to you the same way it does whenever it spins up a new application instance. And one of the things that we can see here is that we don't have any, uh, we don't have any Redis in here, which is quite surprising. Ah, no bound apps. Let's try that again, why don't we? We'll go ahead and tail the logs here as well while we're deploying. I must admit, I am a little surprised. But this is the nature of live demos. So now we should have a bound app. Looks a little better. If we check out the environment again, we can see that we were provided credentials information to connect to Redis, the host, the port, and the password. Now, there's some important things I want you to know. Uh, I, do, I started up an instance of Redis. I didn't care where it was running. You don't notice that I didn't mention an IP address, a host name, or a port. I just let the platform do it for me. I don't care, right? I don't care where it's running, but my application does care where it's running. So when I created the service binding, it asked for that, that information for the instance of Redis. It said, what's your host and what is your, IP or your port number? And then it also said, I'm going to generate a password automatically. So you can see that here. We generated this password fully automatically. No humans were involved in the making of this uh, service connection. It's also nice because the application didn't need to change. So if you want to cycle credentials, which you should be doing on a regular basis in production, you can do that very easily by unbinding an application from a service, rebinding it, which will generate new credentials, and then restarting or doing a rolling deploy of that service. Which, by the way, like I'm feeling a little, uh, a little saucy here, so I want to try something. I want to add, let's see, go to beer in our source code and try another zero downtime deployment. Let's just see what happens. So while that's happening, we've demonstrated now five of the six capabilities in a minimum viable platform. We've demonstrated uh, the routing and load balancing, service discovery, immutable artifacts and immutable artifact repository, log aggregation, um, there was one more, but one of, oh yeah, and, and also infrastructure automation, but we didn't demonstrate the uh, capabilities of the platform when it comes to um, managing failure. So I want to go ahead and type a new endpoint here, and I have two minutes and 30 seconds, so I've done a few deploys here in the last 25 minutes, but why don't, why don't we just do another one here? We'll call it ouch, very basic endpoint. And what happens in this endpoint is we have a little bug and that bug crashes our application. Now it does it in spectacular fashion. This is about as bad as you can get for an application bug that crashes its application. But I'm curious about, uh, our rolling downtime didn't, our rolling upgrade didn't work. I'm curious about what happens here if the platform uh, detects failure in the application, if an application instance actually crashes. And now I have two minutes and I'm gonna go for it. Are we into it? Can we try to go for it? Okay, you can ask me questions after. Well, no, we, we built in time for questions, so we have five minutes. I might take a few of those minutes. So we're gonna go ahead and deploy this application. It has a new endpoint. Um, we're also going to bind our instance again because I had a, a mistake in my zero downtime deploys, and we're gonna go ahead and restart the instances. So now we have go to beer, that's cool. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and scale this out as well. Let's just scale it out to six. And then we're going to type watch. We're going to watch this application. If we watch this information, what you can see is the application starting up and running, and that's cool. We can also see down here uh, that we've got uh, this ongoing, constantly hitting the endpoint that's good. But let's say, and I never ordinarily do this, 
Uh, well, I shouldn't say that anymore because you saw a bug on stage. I was going to say I never write bugs, but sometimes it happens. So what happens if I go to this, this workflow, this user workflow that happens to crash the app? Again, like this could happen. So it crashed that instance right away, and that's no good. So I'm going to go ahead and restart this. I'm going to crash an instance again. And what you can see is a not the noticing of failure from the platform. It noticed that failure recovered automatically. It created instances in its place. I'm going to crash a couple of them. You can also see that this automatically informs the load balancer so that we don't route traffic to failed instances and that we will add them back in when the instances are back up and running. So you see no performance degradation down here uh, as we're constantly hitting the endpoints that work well. You can eventually get to a place if you don't have enough parallel instances where you can crash everything. And we'll go ahead and do that. And you can see that eventually we'll get to a place where the applications aren't running, but it will recover. So you do need to still plan out how much horizontal scalability you need, especially if you happen to have an application that's crashing. So that's pretty good. That was all right. Could have been better. But you can, you can rate me later, so you can decide. You can decide. All right, but why would we do this with just a couple of seconds left? Um, I believe in this concept of cloud-native operability. It's not just about being able to manage, uh, deploy new applications and manage them. Right? It's not about that first install. Like, that gets us very excited to be able to deploy a new architecture, but it's also about managing that for the next day, and the next week, and the next year, and the next 10 years. You have to be able to manage your application long term. And your business has to be able to afford to do that. Right? Your organization needs to be able to afford to do that. So I think what we've learned, both at this conference and broadly in our industry, is that microservices architectures are a good way to go in order to get the scale, the horizontal scalability, the ability to move fast when you need to move fast, and to iterate at the speed that you need to iterate on a service-by-service -service level in your architecture. It also helps you scale out your organization. Right? Your organization can't scale if everybody's working on the same code every day. You can't do that with 1,000 engineers. You need continuous delivery. You must automate your delivery of your software. If you don't automate your delivery and you go from one monolith to 500 microservices, you've, you've taken one fire, one thing that's very hard to do, and you've made it 500 things that are very hard to do. So don't do microservices without automating your deployment pipeline. And finally, we do need a DevOps culture. If we talk about doing the DevOps, what that really means is a practice about how we work together, a culture of learning and sharing and measuring, automation and collaboration. But, and this is the slide to, to take a picture of, if you have a microservices strategy, a continuous delivery process, or, or a DevOps cultural strategy, something that an executive wrote a memo about and, and emailed you about, and you don't have an operationally mature environment to deploy your applications into, those initiatives will not work. So you do need something. It doesn't have to be Cloud Foundry, but you need something that's operationally mature. So we can be friends on Twitter. We can be friends in real life. That's what that beer icon is about. Um, there are a couple of resources. I was using uh, a lightweight version of Cloud Foundry that you can run on your laptop too. You can see that demo app on GitHub. Now you can rate me and thank you very much for your time. Okay, a couple of questions. Questions, let's do it. Um, so, minimum viable platform. You had a lot of points on that list. Yes. Do you really believe that that is the minimum? That's a great question, yes. Um, those are the minimum set of capabilities that you need, bare minimum. And you may need more, depending on your context. You may need uh, specific fine grain authorization controls and, and access controls. You may need uh, some specific types of security expectations around encryption and, uh, and workload placement. Now, you may need a lot of other things, uh, but you'll never need fewer. Okay. So another question here. Uh, didn't the whole platform as a service thing fail? Uh, low adoption of Google, Google App Engine, Heroku, login, and so on? Right. Uh, no. Um, so I, I'll put my ha pivotal hat on for a moment. Um, we sell to uh, like one third of the Fortune 100 in the United States is, is our customer running on Cloud Foundry. Um, and we do business with large organizations all over the world who love what we have to do. One of the things that people uh, shy away from, and I think per perhaps rightfully so, is uh, putting your sensitive applications and your sensitive data in a multi-tenant environment that's managed by someone else. Now, that's not to say that, say, AWS has all the compliance regulations you need. Definitely run your apps on AWS. You can feel secure in that environment. But when you take something like Heroku uh, and you put your sensitive data there, you may be a little less uh, safe in that way. So one of the things I like about Cloud Foundry, one of the things that people who adopt it, uh, including you know, Bluemix, which is run on Cloud Foundry, 
uh, its core is open source Cloud Foundry, is that you can run it in your own environment. You can run it where you feel safe. You can run it where your security and compliance mm -hmm. expectations mat match. Okay. So you asked if uh, people build enterprise grade apps, yeah. right? And there's a, there's a question here. So our architects uh, told us to implement an abstract enterprise factory bean factory. Uh, does that mean we're doing enterprise software? <laughs> Um, it, it means that someone somewhere thinks they, they've, they're building enterprise-grade software. No. Um, enterprise software, especially in a microservices environment and a distributed systems environment, um, I think what that means, what that means for a modern technology is that you respect Conway's law, which we've talked about today. I don't need to re rephrase that. We, expect the, we respect the CAP theorem. We expect failure and we build resilient systems that can respond to that failure. So we use the circuit breaker pattern, we use service discovery, um, we use uh, good load balancing and caching mechanisms in order to have services that are resilient in their ecosystem when they fail. I think we learned that from Netflix, uh, thanks to Adrian and, and his teams, and I think that's the way you build enterprise grade software. Last question, what's the difference between services and apps on Cloud Foundry? Right. Um, a service is something that can be managed by the platform or managed outside of the platform. But a service in our context is usually something that you want to provision either new instances of on demand or provision access to, again, on demand. Um, so you can write your own services and you can start to decompose your architecture that way. Um, and then at, when we say applications, these are usually uh, applications that you're building uh, that and managing that are part of your business value and it's usually something that uh, is either an API or backing service for uh, for another thing or um, or an application that actual you know human beings might interact with okay thank you Casey thank you thank you